that working? Oof. <laughs> Everyone awake? I'm going to be the only one standing behind the post and also the only one um, using uh, my notes. I hope that doesn't make me a too conservative researcher here. But also I'm not going to talk about um, um, open science or what open science is. I'm more talking about um, why science is not open. So I guess my um, implicit or inherent um, conservatism is also symbolically well represented here. So um, in my presentation, I want to offer um, a conceptual framework to understand um, why science is not yet able to use digital technology to its full potential. And I want to relate this framework to open science and in particular to the journal flipping approach in open access that is um, happening in many European countries at the moment. Um, in my view, um, this approach, this journal flipping approach to open access could have an adverse effect and I would like to use this opportunity to discuss that with you. So the overall question that I'm trying to answer today or that I'm trying to give some background to is um, are we running the risk of repeating um, the mistakes from the past and are we creating an inefficient system today? To start off, um, we have to go back in time and talk about the history of the typewriter, which I believe is a very good metaphor for science today because it explains why inferior standards prevail. So in the 1870s in Milwaukee, the American inventor um, Christopher Latham Scholes um, invented one of the first typewriters. His um, first designs repeatedly failed in the field because the type bars, so the, the keys, would constantly um, block um, each other. And together with a stenographer, he worked on improving the machine and finally arrived at the so-called QWERTY keyboard, where the most commonly used keys or the most commonly used um, type bars are positioned as far away as possible on the keyboard so they would not block each other anymore. So this hack made it possible for Scholl's keyboard to become a commercial success. And um, it was very soon a little helper in almost every um, American company in times of industrialization. So he was not the first one to uh, work on a typewriter. He was not the first one to invent a typewriter, but he was the first one that, um, whose typewriter was commercially successful and established a standard that, that still prevails today. We are still using the QWERTY keyboard. If you look at your uh, keyboard, for example, at your laptop, or if you look at your smartphone, you're still using um, the QWERTY keyboard. So now we have to jump again um, in time, and now it's the 1930s, and we are um, in, in Washington, and um, August Tvorak develops um, the first um, DSK keyboard, the so-called Tvorak Simplified keyboard. On the DSK keyboard, the most commonly used keys were positioned um, user-friendly, which made it, uh, its user um, um, possible to type up to 40% faster compared to a QWERTY keyboard. However, Despite its clear advantage um, over the QWERTY keyboard, the DSK keyboard never caught off. Scholl's keyboard was inferior, but it became the standard, and Dvorak lost. And even today, we are still using, of course, the QWERTY logic, despite the fact that our devices have no mechanical limitations anymore. Um, just as I said, look at your smartphone, you're still using the QWERTY keyboard. And the situation when an inferior standard um, prevails it, it is called um, path dependence. And it also explains, for example, why Windows um, won against Macintosh or VHS um, um, won against Beta. Um, path dependence is when a situation was logic in the past um, because of the contextual factors um, that were there at the, at the, at the, the past, um, when the past decision was made. But um, it leads to a situation in the present where still the um, decision of the past prevails, but the factors are no longer relevant. For example, the mechanical reason so that the type bars are positioned as far as way, away as possible on the keyboard um, are no, re no longer re relevant today, but we are still using, of course, the QWERTY keyboard. Um, even though there are no type bars that could block anymore, we are still using the QWERTY frequency. And explanations for this um, are manifold. Um, they are example, um, network effects, so when the use of something becomes higher, the more people use it. So you have, for example, whole industry developing around the QWERTY keyboard and everyone is using it, making it easier, for example, in training. Also, lock-in effects, um, um, when the switching costs are considered too high um, for the market participants, um, for example, um, because um, um, everyone is trained already on the QWERTY keyboard, it would be such a high effort to, to um, learn another um, keyboard. 
um, um, logic. And also the penguin effect, which you um, can see in the picture here, named after penguins on an, on an ice floe, waiting for the first penguin to jump in the water to see if there are predators waiting. And also this, I think, um, relates a bit to, to science today and to open science in a way, because a lot of us are waiting um, um, to um, wait for the first um, um, penguin to jump into the water to see if there's um, a no predator waiting for, um, um, for us. So again, what has um, this got to do with science today and academic publishing? I think also academic publishing can be described as a path-dependent system of knowledge creation and dissemination where past decisions lead to an inefficient system in the present. And this becomes um, particular obvious in the case of open science. I guess many of you, and I think um, um, Arnaud and um, um, Laurent made that um, clear as well, would argue that open science, open science is a tautology. Open and science actually mean the same thing, and open science um, is, um, um, science is per definition open. Um, this, for example, becomes apparent when we look at the um, um, history of science and scientific philosophy. For example, this guy here is Robert K. Merton, and he um, um, kind of established from his Mertonian norms of democratic science or modern and democratic science in the 1950s. And um, two of them are, for example, communalism. So the idea that every um, scientific product belongs to the community of scientists. Another one is called disinterestedness. So I'm, I'm working for the common good and not my own good, for example. Another one is called organized skepticism. So when um, I think um, it was um, um, Laurent was talking about or Arnaud, I think, was talking about data and using data for replication studies, for example. This is a perfect case for organized skepticism because then we can use the data that others published and, um, and, and look as the, the community of scientists if the result is um, correct or not. Um, another guy is um, Karl Popper, whose picture you can see here. He's, um, um, he's famous for his critical rationalism. Um, his critical rationalism also relates very much to organized skepticism, I think. Um, as the idea that um, nothing should ever um, be considered the final truth. So the sighting, that's why the black swan is here, the sighting of a thousand white swans might suggest that all swans are white. Um, the sighting of one black swan falsifies that. So his idea is the um, um, idea of falsificationalism and we should always try to falsify um, um, results, um, which of course is not possible if um, for example, the code or the data is not um, made available, or at least it's a very, 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 very high effort. For example, when you were talking about a replication studies, you can make easy data-driven replication studies by using the data and code available of published results. In fact, of course, um, the data is most of the time not available, and um, the, the code is not available, and the data documentation is often shitty, so you cannot do a replication study, for example. So. Nevertheless, these um, um, book old ideas resonate um, in the term open science, a term that we use for a multitude of ideas today um, to say how science can cope with technology and can use technology to make um, um, science more efficient and more effective and in a way more beneficial for um, 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 society in total. Um, and I think this um, relates to a lot of the ideas and topics that we um, um, discuss when we talk about open science, because I think, as you all know, open science is more like an umbrella term and a buzzword. Um, with it come, come a lot of um, um, new practices and approaches and products um, that, that are discussed. For example, um, data sharing. So open data means that we can use data um, of published results in order to test them, for example, just in the case, um, as in the case of um, um, Karl Popper, for example, or organized skepticism. Um, from Robert K. Merton, but only very few researchers make the data openly um, available, and openly I mean also in a reusable manner. So this is um, um, from a study that um, um, colleagues and, and, um, of mine and me um, um, conducted, and I think you might not be able to read the numbers from the back, but I'm going to read them out. So this was um, um, just from the descriptive results, so we asked 1,600 researchers from all disciplines about the data practices and how they um, handle their data, and we also asked them if they have shared data in the past. And um, these results are from 2015, and only 13% have ever um, made their data available um, openly um, in their whole career. But 60%, um, almost 60% have shared data with people that they know. So 
we already know the, the, the use of, for example, of, of open data, or at least of data reuse, um, but we share selectively. And the idea of openness, of course, is not um, um, present. It is more um, um, something that we practice, um, or that we preach, but not practice at the moment. Um, also, for um, what you can see here, 16% um, um, of the researchers um, um, never made the data available. So, of course, like we have a lot of support for open science and we have a lot of events. And if you um, talk to any research organization, they would say open science is great. But if you look at the facts, um, um, not so much open science is taking place at the moment. And of course, um, this needs to change, as um, Laurent also, I think, made clear when he talked about um, early career researchers. Another example that I want to um, dive into is um, open access. Um, I guess, is, as most of you know, know um, probably from working at um, um, your own institution, or I'm not sure, at least I know it from working at my institution, that um, a lot of the articles that we want to um, um, get or reach are not available and are hidden behind um, um, paywalls. So um, open access means, of course, that um, scientific publications are available to everyone. And this clearly, clearly relates again to Merton's idea of communalism, for example, so that scientific produ products belong to everyone and not, of course, to a journal publisher in a way. And, but most um, 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 publications are still hidden behind paywalls. And, um, yeah, and um, um, I think, again, here um, um, I have another graph that is um, um, hard to read, but I'm gonna, gonna explain it to you, of course. Um, and, I th um, and a lot of this, um, a lot of this, um, I'm just sorry. Because I, 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 I didn't um, look at my notes and I was just doing it freely, so I'm, I'm also... Okay. okay. Anyways. So, um, um, of course, a lot of this, um, when we talk about open access, also goes back um, to decisions in the past and to ideas of um, and path dependence, um, in, in a way, because um, in the 50s and 60s, um, and most of the journals were, were still in the hands of the scientific community. But then um, and we decided, um, of course, as a way, of course, as a, also to, um, you know, make the work um, um, easier and, and the task perhaps of the scientist is not um, to um, um, hand, uh, give out the, the journals. They decided to um, um, sell the journals to um, journal publishers. And at the beginning, it was a lot of journal publishers, but then, of course, they also um, got together. And now we have the situation today that um, in um, about five or four publishers um, own um, a large percentage of the journals um, in which we publish today. And um, this question that I want to want to answer now is um, are we reproducing um, an, an inefficient system because um, what is happening at the at the moment is um, that um, that um, a lot of um, 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 libraries and also um, um, research organizations are doing um, big negotiations to do um, um, journal flipping and in the idea of journal flipping you would um, scientific institutions would pay um, an annual lump sum that covers publication costs of all papers whose first authors are, in this case, German um, for, um, German institutions. So that would mean um, each of the publication in which a German, um, um, German researcher took part becomes open access. At the same time, um, every publication from this um, journal publisher would um, become open access for the um, German researcher. And this is only um, um, in the case of Germany now, but you also had the same development in, um, in Finland, you had the same development in the Netherlands, and in Austria as well. Most of the countries um, that tried to, to do the journal flipping on a large scale off in, in offsetting agreements actually failed or at least didn't get as much as they um, um, wanted to. So um, I think it is safe to say that, that most of them failed. Um, um, I wouldn't, wouldn't um, be too bold there, but. Ideally, this flipping approach eventually leads to the big flip in which publishers would publish open access by default. The big flip would also be um, cost effective in a way, and this is um, um, shown in the graph down there, um, be considering that the cost of paper is between 3,800 euros and 5,000 euros at the moment. And um, according to an estimate by the Max Planck Society and the Deal um, Consortia, the people that do that um, um, negotiation now in Germany is called the Deal um, um, Consortia, is not willing to pay more than 2,000 per paper in the package deal. So, so far, Springer, Nature, and Wiley seem open to the mo model. Um, only Elsevier is still a bit um, bitchy about it because it would, be, would probably lose the most. So, 
journal flipping and um, package deals are, of course, powerful tools and could lead to a game changer in um, when it comes to the availability of um, um, publications, but they come um, with high um, future cost or adverse effects, I would say. And I do not mean the money that is spent on publications by libraries alone, but in relation to the concept of path dependence again, the adverse effects it could have in the future. And here I have um, three bold assumptions that I think lead back to the um, um, QWERTY um, situation again. And I want to um, um, make the point that we are now again at the decisive moment in time. And I think um, we are running the risk to um, um, not using it in the right manner, at least when it comes to open access. So these um, three bold assumptions are is that we are, by these um, deal negotiations and by offsetting agreements, we are excluding um, small players. So large scale package deals um, exclude researchers from institutions and countries that cannot afford to buy in. It is a solution for rich countries, of course, and um, rich institutions, but not for everyone. The second one is um, that we are subsidizing an old product. Um, we have to, to consider that um, um, in a lot of disciplines, many um, um, article publications are not cited once. For example, in my discipline or in my discipline group in social science and economics, it's almost 30% of the peer-reviewed articles. In humanities, of course, they have um, a very special publication culture. It's almost 80%. And even in the natural sciences, it's 20%. But with these um, um, kind of um, decision now, or this policy decision at the moment, we are reproducing or we are also um, um, we are kind of subsidizing an old product and um, instead of also investing into new products, for example, data, as I was saying before, but also code, but also any other product that could um, um, bear or could have um, knowledge, not just articles, of course. And um, the journal flipping approach. And third, the journal flipping approach reproduces dependence on a small number of commercial publishers. So what we are doing is just reproducing the dependence from the same product and the same um, um, companies to the digital age and I think um, this would not be necessary. So coming back to the title of my presentation, um, the journal flipping approach perpetuates the same infrastructure as before, and it probably also per perpetuates the same measures for impact, and it is therefore not an innovation. It is perhaps not only um, the first step towards publishing truly open, it is perhaps only the first step um, towards publishing truly open in the digital age, and we still need to ask ourselves what new models are and what truly could transform the scientific value creation. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm also happy to answer a few of your questions now. <clears throat> Also, sorry for the confusion. I kind of lost the page there. <laughs> no, no, not you. I, I, I sent you uh, um, something wrong. But uh, I hope the point came through anyways. And um, just um, as, a, as a short, um, I could also use the opportunity to make a bit of commercial for a, a blog that a, a friend of, um, uh, two friends of mine and, and I created. It's called Elephant in the Lab. And um, it's a, just a um, blog journal on um, um, science policy. It's also open access and... Um, you're happy to read and, of course, also to contribute if you have something to say. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask if you could comment what other, um, let's say, options there are for organizing, especially peer review. Because in my understanding, I absolutely agree, I think the publishing system is really dangerous in some sense, but most of what's being done in the non-profit side of it that is done by us, the researchers, the production of the knowledge, the peer review, is actually something that is very efficient and, and really useful, I think especially in the natural sciences, up to the point where I believe I might be wrong, that there are even, there's even legislation mm. in place for asking people to publish their lab book, for example. I believe that for in physics or chemistry, it's a legal document, the lab book. So in principle, a publisher could ask for this information, but it's not being done. So are there any kind of options um, that you know of where the peer reviewing system could be saved, um, but for example, this business model could be diminished or changed? Could there be a public um, journal, for example, by a state, run by a state? Is there anything you could comment? Yeah, I, I, in, the, in, your, in your last um, um, sentence, you, you probably already mentioned my, my favorite solution. So instead of like, using the, the money that is spent now on, on um, 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 license, licensing agreements, I would um, rather hope to see um, um, an innovative public you know, infrastructure for, for open science. Um, I think um, um, somebody is also talking about um, um, rep repositories tomorrow and, um, and preprints, for example. 
I think a very innovative idea that is um, out there right now is, for example, overlay journals on top of public repositories or um, overlay journals on, on top of um, a network of repositories. I think this would be a, a great solution. Um, I think I'm, I have nothing against the, the peer review. I'm not sure if I, I said that. I think the, 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 the quality control kind of works. Um, I, I think it also kind of works only because we are publishing more and um, um, increasingly more, and, and it cannot work in, in, in future that every that, that we um, scrutinize every um, 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 result as we do it right now. So in a, in a way, it would be healthy for the system if we would reduce the number of publications, in my point of view. But this is also just a bold assumption. Um, but um, um, I think that the same um, mechanism for, for quality control can be done in a, in a public infrastructure. And um, I am I'm not anti-commercial um, um, in that way. I would um, like to, um, happy to see um, um, you know companies building um, a nice infrastructure because often when we have public infrastructure projects in science or in research, um, they they often don't look look nice, sexy or they're not usable. And then after the the, the money runs out, um, um, the the infrastructure is gone as well. Not in, in, in many cases, but um, I think um, um, the important thing is that um, the, the management and the organization of knowledge um, remains in the hands of the scientists and not just the work um, they are um, I'm doing to um, I'm bringing the stuff out there. And um, so I think this, um, to coming back to this, this point, these negotiations now to, to um, um, come to a, a journal flip and to have a big flip, um, I think this is a um, historic mistake and it kind of shows how many smart people can work in a or how many smart people can and make stupid decisions, and um, this is um, perhaps the case here. What is your opinion on the importance of negative results and failed studies reporting on those and the incentive structure? That is, you know, keeping it such that we don't really see a lot of you know, negative results, except in uh, very few fields. Um, I have to say, um, um, I, I don't really have an informed um, opinion on that. I think um, um, those negative results, of course, need to be made um, um, available, um, um, and and by that also preventing um, that um, others do the same mistakes in a way. But I wouldn't have a, a smart idea how that could happen. So. I'm skipping that question. <laughs> but perhaps also, when, um, now that I think about it, if we, if we think about um, um, an infrastructure for publishing scientific results, this would not only need to be um, um, you know, a public infrastructure for publications, article publications, for example. You could pretty much um, um, just publish anything um, um, on it and then just do the whole organize, um, organization of um, knowledge creation and dissemination on the on a public infrastructure. So then you could also um, put um, negative results there. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> I have to think about it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again to uh, our speakers for their very stimulating uh, talks. I will just remind you that it was only the first day of the conferences. There will still be three, uh, three very interesting uh, days with a lot of talks. Tomorrow we'll be focused on uh, publications. So maybe we will see some uh, other point of view tomorrow. Um, please, thanks a lot. And let's go to the aperitif and buffet and just have talks. Thank you. Thank you.